Um, uh, thanks so much. Uh, at this point, I feel like you've heard a lot about this, and Paul and I have placed a lot of trust in me with this, so I'm going to try not to screw this up too badly. Uh, so this is a paper uh, about obviously strategy-proof mechanisms. And what this is, is it's, it's, it's really a formal attempt to classify dominant strategy mechanisms according to whether or not they are, they are easy for ordinary people to understand. So this paper starts from the observation that we often talk about the importance of having a strategy-proof mechanism. We say that they're important for several reasons. Strategy-proof mechanisms reduce participation costs because they reduce the cognitive cost for each agent to figure out what they should do. They reduce the cost of paying an expert to tell you what you should do. Uh, they reduce the waste from rent-seeking espionage because if you have a dominant strategy, then your optimal action doesn't change and so you, should, you needn't spend money spying on what your opponents are doing. Uh, moreover, these are said to make the outcome robust and detail-free in the sense that the outcome that results in a dominant strategy mechanism doesn't depend on the agent's higher order beliefs about each other's types or, you know, rationality or information. Now notice these benefits I've just listed to you depend substantially on the agents understanding that the game is strategy proof. And if that they don't understand this well, then these benefits may only hold to a very reduced degree. So that uh, leads to a very natural question, which is, uh, we know and we've, for a while in economics, for about 30 years now, we've said, look, some strategy proof mechanisms just are easier for real people to understand than other strategy proof mechanisms. For instance, it's widely held that ascending clock auctions are easier to understand than second price sealed bid auctions. Now, notice that the existing theory does not capture this distinction. In particular, both these games are strategically equivalent. They have the same reduced normal form. Uh, nonetheless, there's a body of experiments, these are only the first two in a very long literature, that establish, in essence, that lab subjects make large and systematic errors in second price sealed bid auctions, and these errors persist even after many rounds of experience, and they, by and large, get it right in ascending clock auctions, and they get it right very quickly, requiring very little experience. Moreover, um, we've got some behavioral game theory concepts uh, meant to model bidders with you know, agents with limited cognitive capacities or who make mistakes, but these concepts tend not to predict errors in strategy-proof mechanisms. They tend to predict that if you have a dominant strategy, you play that strategy. So the research question that I want to answer is, when is it obvious? What makes it obvious that a mechanism is strategy-proof? And the way I'm going to answer that is I'm going to seek a stronger solution concept, which I call obviously strategy-proof. And we'd like this to do several things. First, We'd like it to provide a formal standard of cognitive simplicity. That is to say, we'd like it to take the set of all strategy-proof mechanisms in a very general class and identify a subset of those mechanisms as being obvious for real people to understand. Uh, we'd like it to have predictive power. We'd like it to, do, to go some distance in correctly sorting the cases that people do and don't find easy to understand. And we're going to try to do this in a parsimonious way. And by that, I mean we're going to attempt to do this using only the standard primitives that are already found in classical game theory and while introducing no new degrees of freedom, no new parameters into the model. And of course, uh, because of this, I'm not going to be able to account for every kind of cognitive complexity. For instance, it could be that a mechanism is very complex if the instructions are given to you in a foreign language. I'm not going to be able to capture that. The hope is that we capture a kind of cognitive complexity that explains a substantial amount of variation in the data. So in this paper, I do three things. The first part of this paper is, in essence, pure theory. Uh, I show a new definition, which is a new solution concept, obviously strategy proof, which can be interpreted as an equilibrium in obviously dominant strategies. I then produce two characterization theorems. The first theorem suggests a behavioral interpretation to this concept. Obviously dominant strategies are the weakly dominant strategies that can be recognized as weakly dominant by a cognitively limited agent for a well-defined sense of cognitively limited. Uh, the second theorem suggests a classical interpretation. In particular, obviously strategy-proof mechanisms are those that can be run even when the planner lacks full commitment power, but can only make commitments between that, a, that, that planner and an agent that are bilaterally verifiable. Then there's the second part of the paper, where, uh, in essence, I check whether or not the theory is any empirical bite. I compare, in a lab experiment, strategy-proof and obviously strategy-proof mechanisms that, according to the standard theory, should implement the same allocation rule. And what I find, in essence, is that uh, dominant strategies are played at substantially higher rates under OSP mechanisms than under otherwise very similar mechanisms that are just SP. 
And the last part of the paper is applied theory. I go to a classic mechanism design setting binary allocation problems. These include private value auctions with unit demand, procurement auctions with unit supply, binary public goods games. And I characterize fully the OSP mechanisms and provide necessary and sufficient conditions for you to OSP implement an allocation rule. Now, this is too ambitious for a 30 minute talk. I'm going to try to cover just this first bit and if you're interested in any of the latter bits, uh, you can have a look at the paper. So with all that said, I'd better give you a definition. In this talk, we're going to think of mechanisms as extensive game forms with perfect recall. And we're going to say that a strategy is obviously dominant if for all deviating strategies, at any earliest information set where these two strategies diverge, the best possible outcome under the deviation is no better than the worst possible outcome under the original strategy. Now remember, these are extensive games, so strategies are complete contingent plans of action. They specify what you do at any information set where you might be called to play. Now we're going to say that a mechanism is obviously strategy proof if it has an equilibrium in obviously dominant strategies. Now, um, this is a definition in words, but I'd like to make sure we're on the same page. Uh, so we're gonna build this up formally. Now, this function alpha I'm going to use to pick out the earliest points of departure of two strategies. Yeah. One question. If model is extensive from game to perfect recall, so how would I, a, a second price auction with some So a second price auction is an extensive form game where we have simultaneous moves and we represent that as you make your bid and I make a bid without knowing what your bid is. Can I ask something else? Yeah. In the, when you see the worst possible outcome, that still means that in these other parts of the game, you follow your own strategy. So it's not worse than according to your own possible mistakes in that part. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, no. we're going to make these precise. This will be very clear in a moment. Um, yeah. You might think that for obvious, you'd like to put in some computational caveat in the definition, and checkably so, right? Right, right. Um, and and I'd, I'd like to have that, uh, but I worry that that would reduce the, the, the concept's tractability. That's certainly an interesting extension. I just haven't done that. Um, so I'm going to use this function alpha to pick out the earliest points of departure of two strategies. These are the information sets where strategies first come apart. So uh, an information set is an earliest point of departure if and only if, first, both strategies disagree about what action to take at that information set, and second, uh, both strategies do not rule out reaching that information set. Now here, I've got a standard extensive game uh, I've got a red strategy for player two and a blue strategy for player two. There are four information sets where these strategies disagree about what to do. Um, which of these are earliest points of departure? They're these two in green. Uh, why isn't that one over there an earliest point of departure? Well, because the blue strategy rules out ever reaching that information set. And why isn't this one over here an earliest point of departure? Well, because both strategies rule out ever reaching that information set. So notice, this function alpha picks out, takes as an input two strategies and picks out a set of information sets. There could be more than one, and it does so without prior reference to what your opponent is doing. So I'm going to use, this is the one bit of notation I really need. This thing here is the utility to agent I in some game G. When we start play from some history H, when play proceeds according to this strategy profile, SI, S minus I. When the realization of chance moves is DC, so we're dealing with general extensive games, there can be nodes that are assigned to chance. Uh, that's like a strategy for the chance player. And the resulting outcome is evaluated according to preferences theta I. All so we're in a private pure. value world. All the S's are pure. Yes, SI yes, SI. yes, the S's are pure. Although it turns out you can generalize this to mix without too much difficulty. Um, so I'm going to use H0 to refer to the history that begins the game, and I'm going to use delta C to refer to the probability measure for chance moves. So far, this is all very standard. So over here, um, up top, I've got the standard definition for weak dominance written for extensive form games, and on the bottom, I've got the definition for obvious dominance. Now, I'm sure this crowd has pretty much all seen this definition many times before, uh, but a strategy is weakly dominant if, for all deviating strategies, and for all opponent strategy profiles, the expected payoff under the deviation is no better than the expected payoff under the original strategy. And a strategy is obviously dominant if, for all deviating strategies, at any information set that's an earliest point of departure, the best possible outcome under the deviation going forward is no better than 
the worst possible outcome under the original strategy. Now, it may not be transparent just yet, but I hope it will be soon. Uh, obvious dominance implies weak dominance. This is a strictly stronger criterion. Now, there are two differences between these definitions that I'd like to point out to you. The first difference is that weak dominance invokes H0, the history that begins the game. And what this means is that weak dominance depends only on the normal form of the game. If two games have the same normal form, then they have the same weakly dominant strategies. Obvious dominance looks at histories that are in information sets that are earliest points of departure. And this depends crucially on the extensive form of a game. Two games could have the same normal form, but one game could have obviously dominant strategies and the other might not. And what this means as a corollary is that the standard revelation principle does not apply to obvious dominance. If you take an a game with obviously dominant strategies and you convert that into the corresponding <coughs> direct revelation mechanism, that may or may not preserve obvious dominance. The second difference I'd like to point out to you <clears throat> is that weak dominance holds the histories, the opponent's strategies, and the realizations of chance the same across both sides of this inequality. Whereas obvious dominance looks at the best case on the left-hand side and compares it to the worst case on the right-hand side. And notice these are the best and the worst case subject to having reached the information sets where you're thinking of deviating. Now, with that, it turns out that we can answer the original question that I was posing. What is obvious about ascending auctions that's not obvious about second price? It turns out that second price sealed bid auctions are strategy proof, but they aren't obviously strategy proof. And to see that, here's a simplified second price auction. First player one either bids zero, two, or four, and then player two bids one, three, or five. And let's suppose player two's value is three dollars, so that in blue, the truth telling strategy is to bid three dollars. Now, one thing player two could do is to deviate. He could deviate to bid five dollars, and that's a deviating strategy down there in red. Now, what's the earliest point of departure of these two strategies? Uh, pretty clearly, it's this information set over here in green. Now, what's the best possible outcome under the deviation consistent with reaching this information set? Well, player one could bid zero, in which case player two will win the object at a price of zero for a surplus of three. Now, what's the worst possible outcome that can happen under the truth-telling strategy consistent with reaching this information set? Well, player one could bid four, in which case player two won't win. So notice, the best outcome under the deviation is better than the worst outcome under the original strategy. And what this shows, of course, is that second price sealed bid auctions are strategy proof, but they're not obviously strategy proof. On the other hand, it turns out that ascending auctions are obviously strategy proof. And the way to see that, again, takes this simplified example. We start the price at zero and we ask player one, are you in or out? Then we raise the price by a dollar and we ask player two, are you in or out? Then we raise the price by a dollar and we go back to player one and so on and so on down the game tree. Now again, let's suppose player two's value is three dollars so that the truth-telling strategy <coughs> in blue is to bid until the price hits three dollars and then to quit. And let's look at that same deviation in red to bid until the price hits five dollars and then quit. Now what's the earliest point of departure of these two strategies? Well, that's pretty easy. It's this information set over here in green. Now, what's the best possible outcome from player two's perspective, conditional on reaching this information set under the deviation? Well, remember, player two's value is $3. And once he's hit this information set, the price has just shot past $3. So from his perspective, the best thing that can happen is that player one keeps bidding and he doesn't win. Right? So the best, the best possible outcome under the deviation is that player two gets zero. Now, what's the worst possible outcome under the original strategy consistent with reaching this information set? Well, that's pretty easy. There's only one outcome that could happen, which is that player two doesn't win. So notice, the best outcome under the deviation is no better than the worst outcome under the original strategy. And what this shows, of course, you can see this argument generalizes, is that ascending auctions have not only dominant strategies, they have obviously dominant strategies. They fulfill a strictly stronger solution concept than second price auctions do. Now, so far, so good. I've shown you a new definition, and I've shown you it sorts a case which otherwise looks quite puzzling. But it's quite a reasonable question to ask, what makes obvious dominance obvious? Why is this like an appropriate thing? Yeah. So could you remind me what to do with randomness? It takes also soup and inf with respect to Right, you take the soup and inf with respect to the randomness. So why did you make this choice? Uh, well, it'll turn out that that's important for a second equivalence that I'm going to get to in a bit. There's a second equivalence that only holds if you do it that way. So it's like nature is another player. Right, nature is another player. 
And this is, this is not a novel idea that nature is another player. We're just taking it seriously here as well. Um, so I'm going to show you, in fact, that this definition of obviousness is precisely that picked out by a formal model of a cognitively limited agent. And the model I have in mind is motivated by a separate set of empirical facts, which is that there's a growing body of lab evidence suggesting that contingent reasoning is hard for many people to do. And what I mean by that is that there's, uh, these, lab, these lab experiments document systematic errors in real money decision problems that are attributable to mistakes in case-by-case -case reasoning. Uh, that is to say, when you're making a decision, you have to think about different hypothetical scenarios that have not occurred yet, and you have to integrate this information somehow to reach the optimal decision. Now, I, I don't have time to cover each of these experiments in detail, and I'm happy to talk about them offline. What I want to take away from that is to figure out a way to model agents who make these kinds of mistakes. And how can we do that? Well, let's think about these two games. In these games, player one chooses L or R, and then player two chooses Y or Z. And I've highlighted the only differences between these two games in red. Now, suppose player one prefers outcome A to B to C to D. In that case, then playing L is a weakly dominant strategy in game one, but not a weakly dominant strategy in game two. Now, in order to see that L is weakly dominant in game one, player one needs to reason hypothetically, needs to reason case by case. He needs to say, look, there are two things that could happen. Either two plays Y or two plays Z. And if two plays Y, then I should play L, since I prefer A to B. And if two plays Z, then I should play L, since I prefer C to D. Therefore, I should play L no matter what player two is doing. Now, notice that if player one is bad at contingent reason, bad at keeping track of these cases, then he might know that playing L could lead to A or C, and playing R could lead to B or D. But he wouldn't be able to distinguish these games. It's as though he can't tell these games apart. So we're going to take, find a formal technology to say, play one can't tell games like this apart. And the way we do that is we invoke the notion of an experience. This is a, a thing we use in the theory of extensive games to define perfect recall. The experience of an agent I at history H records the information sets where that agent was called to play and the actions that that agent took in chronological order. So this is a sequence that says, I was at this information set and took this action, then was at this information set and took that action, and so on and so on and so on. I'm going to denote such a thing psi i. Now notice that in a sense, both the games we were looking at generate the same experiences for player one. In both games, if player one was at his information set and didn't choose anything, then he knows the game isn't going to end yet. If he was at his information set and chose left, then he knows that the game could end, and if it does end, it ends in A or C. And if he, he knows that if he was at that information set and chose right, then he knows that if the game ends, it ends in B or D. So to say that player one can't tell these two games apart, we could say player one can't tell games that generate the same experiences apart. So we're going to take that notion and make it fully general for all extensive games with perfect recall. And the way we do that is we say two games, G and G prime, generate the same experiences for a player I, if there exists a bijection lambda from i's information sets and actions in G onto i's information sets and actions in G prime, such that something is an experience in G, if and only if its bijected version is an experience in G prime, and something could, an, an experience could lead to an outcome in G, if and only if its bijected version could lead to that same outcome in G prime. Now this is an equivalence relation, clearly, and it defines a partition on the set of all mechanisms. So what does it mean to say that agents can't distinguish games that generate the same experiences? Well, this partition retains substantial knowledge about the structure of the game. The agent knows all the points where he might be called to play. He knows for any point he might be called to play what actions are available. He knows for any sequence of points he was called to play and actions that he took, whether or not the game might end, and if so, what outcomes it might end at. The thing he lacks is the information necessary to reason case by case about what his opponents are doing. So, so far, we've taken the space of all games. Let's suppose every dot is a game. And we've defined a partition. We said agents can't distinguish games that generate the same experiences. Now, suppose that some strategy was weakly dominant in one game, but its bijected version was not weakly dominant in other games in that equivalence class. Then it won't be obvious to our agent that that strategy is dominant, because he can't tell that game apart from other games which require contingent reasoning to distinguish. On the other hand, suppose that a strategy is dominant not only in one game, 
but in every game in that equivalence class, in every nearby game according to this well-defined sense of nearby, then it's going to be obvious to our agent that that strategy is dominant, even though he doesn't understand these particular details of the game. And the first characterization theorem, in essence, says we're entitled to remove the quotation marks. Uh, a strategy is obviously dominant, according to that definition I showed you earlier, in some game G, if and only if for all games that generate the same experiences for I as G, that strategy, the bijected version, is weakly dominant in G prime. Now, how does this proof work? Essentially, what you show is that if a strategy is not obviously dominant in G, you can take a sequence of transformations of that game, never leaving the equivalence class, to produce a game where that strategy is not weakly dominant. And the other way goes that if a strategy is not weakly dominant in G prime, then you can in fact locate an earliest information set where that agent would like to deviate. And you can take, uh, you can look back through this bijection to locate a point in the original game G where the obvious dominance inequality doesn't hold. So what this is saying is, look, Rather than modeling agents who understand every detail of every game, these agents understand some details of the game but not others. And the strategies they can nonetheless verify to be weakly dominant are the ones that are obviously dominant. So that's one notion of what this thing is doing. But here's a separate notion that's classical. Uh, I'm going to show you that a notion of what the planner can do when she has only partial commitment power is in fact coextensive with the notion of OSP implementation. And so let's think about the standard mechanism design paradigm. One of the very deep assumptions in the standard paradigm is that the planner has full commitment power. The planner writes down the game and that's what's going to happen. In particular, we assume that the planner can make commitments even about events that no individual agent observes. For instance, in a sealed bid auction, we assume that the planner can commit to the function from all bid profiles into allocations, even if each agent only observes his own bid. Now, sometimes that's a realistic assumption, and sometimes it's not a realistic assumption, and it'd be good to know what happens if we relax that assumption. And we've known this for a while. For instance, in Vickery's original paper, uh, he points out that if you don't have a trusted third party to run a sealed bid auction, then the auctioneer might be tempted to insert show bids so as to alter his revenues. Uh, and there's a 21st century of this problem, 21st century version of this problem, which you've basically seen all morning, which is if your algorithm has to attempt over 100,000 NP complete problems in the course of the auction, then it might be quite hard for bidders to verify what you're doing. It might be quite costly. And if you tell them this is what you're doing, they may or may not believe you. So notice that it seems like this distinction also appears to track the second price versus ascending auction distinction. In particular, in a second price sealed bid auction, if the auctioneer might peek at the bids and then insert shell bids, you probably shouldn't bid your true value. You should probably shade your bid a bit. On the other hand, in an ascending clock auction, suppose I tell you, look, this is the price. The price is at $10. If you say you're out now, you're definitely out. If you say you're in, maybe you'll win at $10, or maybe I'll raise the price and ask you again. Now, a lot of other things could be going on in the rest of this auction, right? A lot of things could be going on with the other bidders that you have no idea about. But looking only at this bilateral guarantee, you know that you should keep bidding until the price hits your value, and then you should quit. And you know, as you can see from the talks earlier this morning, it turns out that every deferred acceptance auction with threshold pricing has a clock auction implementation. And that, it turns out, importantly relates to the idea of partial commitment. So how can we make this notion precise? The planner has less than, partial com less than full commitment power. Well, here's one way. I don't claim it's the only way, but I think it's a natural way. We're going to add, in addition to the set of agents n, player 0, the planner. And the way this game works is the planner chooses some agent and sends along a message along with a set of acceptable replies. The agent observes this, the agent observes this, and then chooses a reply. The planner observes the reply and, and, and can either then choose to repeat the above process, potentially with someone else, or can announce an outcome and end the game. Now it should be fairly apparent that using this sort of machinery, I can essentially run any extensive game that moves in discrete steps. Now, I'm going to use psi zero to denote the set of all planner strategies. These strategies tell the planner you know, um, what messages to send, what replies to regard as acceptable, which message to send next as a function of the replies she's already gotten, when to end the game, what outcome to announce when the game ends. And I intend psi zero to include even the mech strategy so the planner could be running a random mechanism where she's randomizing between different options. Now, the standard full commitment paradigm says the planner commits to a unique strategy in the set of all her strategies. But we can instead require only bilateral commitments. And what does that mean? 
It means that for each agent, the planner commits to a subset of her strategies, where that subset is measurable with respect to eyes observations in the game. And what I mean by that is that if the planner plays a strategy outside this subset, then with positive probability, that agent might know for certain that the planner has deviated. So notice, this is potentially a different subset for each agent, and the planner gets to choose a profile of these things. Now we're going to say that a choice rule is supported by bilateral commitments, one for each agent if three things hold. The first requirement is that there exists planner strategy, a planner strategy and agent strategies that result in the outcome that the choice rule requires. I mean, this, this has got to be in there somewhere. The second requirement is that for, for all agents, the planner's strategy is compatible with the commitment that agent has been offered. This is saying these commitments are binding. The third requirement is that for all agents, agent I's strategy is optimal given any strategies from the other agents and any planner strategy compatible with just agent I's bilateral commitment. So the thought is looking only at the bilateral commitment agent I has been offered, I must be able to deduce the optimality of his assigned strategy. Now it seems like a natural question then goes, when do there exist bilateral commitments that support a choice rule? And the following holds in full generality. Uh, a choice rule can be supported by bilateral commitments, even only if that choice rule is OSP implementable. And this might seem a bit of an unusual result, but the key intuition works like this. A bilateral commitment is almost equivalent. It's not quite. There are some technical issues to do with sets of measure zero, but it's almost equivalent to the planner saying, I'm only going to run games in some equivalence class that generate the same experiences for you. So when is it the case that no matter what strategy the planner is playing, you can know that your strategy is optimal? Well, your strategy has got to be dominant not only in this game, but in every game that generates the same experiences. By the first theorem, we know that's true even only if it's an obviously dominant strategy. So it turns out that in addition to having a behavioral interpretation, the notion of OSP implementation, in fact, tracks a classical interpretation. It tracks the set of choice rules that you can carry out when you have only bilateral commitment power, when you can only write down commitment contracts of a form that you and that agent could verify bilaterally. So um, I've only managed to get through the first third of this paper, and I'm not going to be able to get through all of the remainder. Uh, but just as a preview, it does seem like this concept does track the cases where people find it easy to play a game versus the cases where people find it difficult. Uh, obviously, I haven't exhaustively searched the space of all games, but it does seem to have some empirical bite in classifying things correctly. And it turns out that in the, circ in the set of binary allocation problems, so you've got a single dimensional type, you've got, uh, you know, you've got quasi-linear utility, there are transfers, uh, every OSP mechanism is essentially a monotone price mechanism, which is a new generalization of ascending clock auctions. So what this says, in essence, is that this compact criterion, this requirement of obvious dominance, by itself entails not all, but quite a lot of the structure of what goes into an ascending auction. If you don't have binary allocation problems, if you look at more general environments, this is not true. There are, in fact, more exotic OSP mechanisms that are out there. Um, so I think, you know, I've spoken quite a lot. Uh, I feel like I really like to take questions and get people's sense in this. Uh, I'd be happy to open to questions. Thank you. Yeah. I, re I really like the, the talk and the idea. I worry that the solution concept might not be quite strong enough. Okay. Uh, and the reason I worry that is that uh, it seems like you've thought very carefully about agents being limited in contingent reasoning, not being able to look back up the tree and yep. about what might have happened. But you don't seem to have thought as carefully about agents being limited in looking down the tree beyond the current node. You, you think that they can, they can evaluate this inequality regardless of the downstream complexity of the tree. And, I, and all the examples you give uh, yeah. obscure this by making it really obvious. As soon as you're, you're at a branch point, yeah. something immediately happens. Yeah. I wonder if you think that there could be an amount of complexity down the tree where an agent would have trouble doing the verification. Oh, yeah, yeah. So here, here's an example of a game with an obviously dominant strategy which probably, where, where the theory probably gets it wrong. If you give me the first 100 digits of pi in order, I'll give you $100 and $0 otherwise. Now, I suspect that this, this has an obviously dominant strategy. I suspect most of us would fail to, in fact, uh, get the $100. Uh, somebody might, uh, this is not an actual offer. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's clear that there are some forms of complexity this is not going to capture. And sometimes those are going to be important forms. Is that an 
example of the kind of complexity I talked about, though. I mean, I'm worried that a lot of stuff happens after uh, my move. Yeah. My, uh, whatever you call it, the earliest yeah. point. Yeah. And that I have trouble, I essentially have to do contingent reasoning downstream. I have to start thinking about well, all the things that might happen. So w what you need to do is you need to know what might happen following one move and what might happen following another. So you need to be able to list the possible outcomes and check that they have a set-wise dominance relation rather than a state-wise dominance relation. So the thought is rather than needing to sort of match up for each opponent's strategy profile, this move is better than that move, you can just say, look, it doesn't matter what my opponent's strategy profiles are. This set is set-wise dominates that set. And that's a sense in which it's easier, but sometimes that could still be hard to calculate. So I'll leave you alone after saying one more thing. But I yeah. guess what I'm worried about is that you're, you're sort of appealing to the idea that the game itself is obvious. Yeah. I mean, you know, even the pie game, it had a very succinct description, so you're able to tell it to me. Yeah. I'm worried that the game tree itself is so complex that it, it happens to be um, complex yeah. in the sense of having a long description length. Well, and it, it happens to be obviously strategy proof, but I can't really get the whole game in my head. That, that, that's true, though. The TV station side of the incentive auction also has a very long description length. Uh, the, 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 the neat fact feature of it being obviously strategy proof is that to get you to see your dominant strategy, a partial description sufficed. Right. And I, 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 you know, I, I don't have a formal way to make that statement yet, but there is a sense in which partial description suffice in the sense you only need to know up to the class that generate the same experiences. Yeah. Oh, um, so you to find this notion obviously strategy proof, and I'm wondering if uh, there's a reason that you need to focus on strategy proof. Like it obviously is an adjective that you could say this is obviously a Nash equilibrium. So the the thing I'd like to say next, and I haven't found the technology to say it yet, is this is an obvious ex post equilibrium. I think that would be a useful thing to have, but I haven't found the right way to do it. Um, if anybody else wants to have a stab as well, you know, I I. I you know, this, this certainly isn't something that I think I can manage completely on my own here. Um. So, thanks. Oh, no, 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 no. So, it seems that one of the nice properties you get by this obviously thing that even if uh, you affect what other agents are doing, so right. Right, then you're still sort of a strategy. Right. It's sort of an adversarial notion like that. Even adversarial, right. So right. You we don't think of the other guy's project depending on yours, but only through them. But somehow it means that you're sort of, I mean, do you have something that shows that, you know, I don't care what I, what kind of information I give to the others or anything like that? So that's sort of equivalent notion? Uh, I, I don't yet. I, I, I think there might be a characterization that says if you allow interchanging the order of simultaneous moves and obviously dominant strategy is one where even if you interchange orders of moves and every agent perfectly observed what you did, uh, it's still a dominant strategy, but that's, that, that's a conjecture rather than a formal statement. Oh, no, thank everybody again.